Last week, we kicked off a sermon series on the incarnation. Now, that's a $10 theological term that is used to express the Christian understanding that Jesus of Nazareth is God, the living word in the flesh. Quite literally, the word incarnation means God in meat. And that reminds me, of course, of one of my favorite dishes, chili con carne, incarnation, carne. And so that's where the inspiration of the title of this sermon series, God con carne. And you know, Jesus coming to us as a human being changes everything. And last week, we looked at how the incarnation changes our relationship with God. By, by becoming human and by God coming to us in the flesh, it reveals God's intense passion and love for us, the beings he's created. And after the service last week, I was chatting in the atrium with my friend Doyle Peterson, and he mentioned to me that the attire I was wearing last week reminded him of a headline from a website that he reads called the Babylon Bee. Um, the headline read, trend-setting countercultural youth pastor tucks in shirt and wears slacks. So for those of you who don't know, Babylon Bee is like this satirical uh, news site and uh, it's, it's fake news in the name of fun. And I had to laugh because I had no intention of being countercultural. I, I, I don't know, like, how, does a, how do slacks be countercultural? Uh, I, I leave fashion statements for, uh, for people like Lady Gaga. Um, but to be honest, my decisions about whether to tuck or untuck a shirt, I was tucked last week, it's based mainly on whether said shirt configuration accentuates or hides my, uh, my middle-aged belly bulge. <laughs> and um, and it's that conversation really struck me last week because as we turn our attention now to the incarnation again, we're, we're looking at how Jesus becoming human can change our relationship to our own humanity. Um, and my relationship with this belly bulge illustrates quite vividly that we often have a very conflicted relationship with our own humanity, particularly our physical bodies. I'd like to say I'm okay with my physical imperfections, but then why would I try to hide them with the clothes I wear? Um, I've even, uh, for as most of you know, I'm blind in my right eye. It's quite obvious. Uh, for quite a long time, I used to wear a cosmetic contact lens to make that eye appear normal. It's kind of duplicitous, right? It's kind of a double standard. I'm okay with my imperfections, but not too okay. Can anybody relate to that duplicity? I won't make you raise your hands. But why do we pour so much attention into our appearances? Do we do this out of uh, respect and gratitude for what God has given us? Or do we resent these bodies that he's given us? Do we see our bodies as something, to be, uh, as something good and something to be celebrated? Or are they a problem to be dealt with? You know, there's too much of my body here and well, not enough of it there. This part's okay. That part, oh man, that is just wrong. Um, you know, when, when I observe life in our Canadian society, I see a lot of us living in the tension between two extremes. On one extreme, we can work tirelessly to reach an ideal. And this ideal isn't even possible for the uh, airbrushed and retouched models that present that ideal to us. And the closer we get to that ideal, the less satisfied we uh, tend to be with ourselves. And then on the other extreme is apathy. We check out, and we neglect our bodies, and we despair over them, and we convince ourselves they're not important. And then the longer we neglect ourselves, uh, the less healthy we get and the less happy we are. And these are extremes. But I'm, I'm telling you that even though those are like kind of two extreme poles of, of, of an attitude, um, they're more prevalent than you think. In 2017, a survey of Canadians was done, and it revealed that there are over one million people in our country who uh, would meet the criteria for an eating disorder, as described in the DSM, which is like the Bible of uh, mental disorders. 
And then on the other side of the extreme, the recent census data indicates that over 5 million Canadians are obese. So, as Canadians, we have a conflicted relationship with our bodies. And almost a quarter of us are, are already at risk of some serious trouble. Um, and most of us are kind of somewhere in between on those two extremes. We get caught up in comparison games or, or we get too, busy looking after, uh, get too busy doing things that we don't take the time to look after ourselves. Um, and both extremes miss the mark. And, uh, and from what I see and, and from how uncomfortable everybody looks from staring at that picture for as long as it's been up there, I know that it's, this is uncomfortable territory. But from what I see, what I see in the Bible and what I've learned from experience, and I hope that you will learn today, is that I am my body and my body is good. I hope you can learn to appropriate that for yourself today. I am my body and my body is good. And before we dive, but before we dive into what the Bible has to say about this, and because it's Mother's Day, I wanted to invite the mother of my children to come up here and share a little bit about this tension. Um, this is a topic that, that Becky feels pretty passionately about, and uh, she's just going to share a little bit of how she's lived in this tension of the two extremes, and, uh, and how Jesus has met her in that tension. So she can say it better than I can, so I will leave it to her. There you go. Yes, I can. <laughs> All right. All right, no, just kidding. Um, it would actually be really so much easier for me to stand here and, um, you know, have some really funny ones, one-liners and self-deprecating humor um, that could illustrate my personal struggle with um, body image. In fact, you know, comedians and sitcoms do it all the time. Um, but it's... It's not really, it doesn't really give honor to the importance of the topic or respect. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, and for those of you who, oh, sorry, sorry. for those of you who may know me or have known me, uh, you may not really realize this part of my story. So um, I'm sorry for holding it for so long, so close to my, my chest. Um, but I'm quite masterful at uh, controlling the narrative around me. So I apologize. Um, I became aware of my struggle with body image probably at about the age of 11. I uh, got super tall really fast, which is really funny. That's actually the joke part because I'm only five foot two. And so at 11, I was pretty tall. Um, um, but I was like really, really skinny. I was a tomboy. I love sports. I love competing with boys. Um, but I was conflicted as to what it meant to be a woman. And I thought being a woman meant you had to go on a diet. I pretty much, that was my connection there. I had nothing to do with my parents. They were extremely loving. They were amazing people, and they probably had no idea that I had the startings of an internal struggle. Um, it continued on into high school. I played a lot of sports. I, I was very high achieving in school, and I would come home and exercise. Um, all the while, fueling myself with a V8 drink, those little V8 cans, because um, I thought that was a healthy choice, right? And certs candies, enough sugar to get by. Um, my first job was in a smoke-filled donut shop, which was quite convenient at suppressing my appetite. Um, and I soon discovered the benefits of caffeine and how you could really live off a lot of coffee. Um, so it was probably here right around 16, 17, I could have met those diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder. Um, but it was like really, um, really good at hiding my struggle. I rationalized it saying that, oh, this is my way of controlling stress and anxiety. And I'm going to church and I'm getting baptized and I'm going to go off to Bible school. You know, that, like my body's different from like my spiritual life. That's more important, right? Um, I had disconnected my body, and I was anything but kind to it. Um, so God's intervention number one in my life came uh, by meeting a Mennonite boy. So my relationship with food was going to be radically challenged. 
I ate just enough to live, but as many of you know, Mennonites celebrate and they live to eat. In fact, um, it's an actual love language and they uh, have a book about it called the Mennonite Treasury Cookbook. I don't know how many of you might have that, but I own one. I have no idea what any of it says and nor can I cook it, but my mother-in-law can. She's amazing. So, um, you know, as a young woman, I fell in love. I had a husband who adored me, and he adored my body. Sorry, girls, that's embarrassing, but that's how you came to be. And um, I was one of those weird women who actually liked being pregnant. Like, I loved the experience. For the first time, I felt beautiful. For the first time, I actually cared for my body what I was putting into it, how I was treating it. But looking back, I would say it wasn't to honor this as God's temple. It was definitely to benefit my unborn child. So this is where God's intervention number two came in. Mike and I have three beautiful daughters, and it was after my third daughter was born that um, I was diagnosed with postpartum depression. Um, I hadn't really realized the extent to which I had neglected myself. I wasn't sleeping, definitely not sleeping, because as new moms know, um, and I wasn't eating. Um, and uh, I was disconnecting with my mind and my emotions were all over the place. Um, I was trying really hard to be a good mom, and you know, I definitely attended church here back in the day as well, doing that, and um, I would get very well, well-meaning compliments like, oh man, like how did you get your body back so fast? And I was like, get it back? Where did it go? Like, it's always been here, right? And I had not um, been treating it very well at all. Um, but a fake smile and a good outfit goes a long way. And so again, I was really good at covering that up. But I needed that medical intervention, and I'm really glad I received that at that time. And fast forward to now, I'm in my 40s. Things like to continue to change, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, God continues to challenge me in uh, how he sees me. My three girls show me um, what strength and beauty and acceptance really are. And in spite of my weakness and in spite of maybe the messages I sent them along the way while raising them, um, they still love me, and they call me mom, and I get to still do that in their life. Um, I pray that I can kind of continue to offer my struggle in myself as a living sacrifice to God so that he can redeem all of me, not just the parts I want to give him. Um, I want to leave you with a verse that's often quoted during baby dedications, and I've always said, oh, this is like such a cute little baby verse. Um, but as you listen to the psalmist, it's like, it's about me. I've had to claim it for myself. Um, it says, for you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. And so I also hope that you will know that full well. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Becky. Now, on Mother's Day, I'm keenly aware how these extreme mindsets that we contend with can impact a mom. Uh, God has given you bodies which can grow a human being. And when I stop and I contemplate this, like, it blows my mind. Um, it's amazing that you can do that. And many of you have done it more than once. And yet, as Becky shared, uh, this life-giving process can really mess with us on a number of levels. And it's easy to get sucked into extreme attitudes towards our body. And so thanks for starting us off by sharing your personal perspective on this, uh, Becky. And now I want to kind of turn to the Bible to kind of just keep fleshing this perspective out. That's my lame dad joke for the day. Flesh it out, huh? Anyways, uh, let's, let's start at the very beginning. Let's start at page one of the Bible there and turn to Genesis chapter one. I'm just going to quickly read uh, some, some verses here that basically go back to like 
you know, this is the earliest thought about our existence as human beings. Uh, I'm going to start in Genesis 1 at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. A little further on there in chapter 2, we get some more detail as to how this all looks. On uh, 2 verse 7, The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. How many of you, when you open your Bible and see living being, does it say being in your version? Yeah? Okay. How many of you have like living soul in yours? No? No King Jamesers here? Uh, What about any other words? Like when you look in your Bible, can just tell me, do you hear any other, is there any other word there for being? Person. Person? He became a living person. So, um... I'm going to drop a little Hebrew on you right now. So when God breathed in and, and into the nostrils and, and the life went into the, the dirt, the man became a living nephesh. All right? And this is a word that is used hundreds of times in the Bible. And, uh, and it's worth understanding completely what this word really means because there's a lot, a lot of baggage there in this word. And... I found some guys who did a way better job of explaining what this word means than I could hope to in like a short little snippet of time. So I'm going to just play a video from the Bible Project that explains what it means to be a living being. Man, there's just so much there. I've watched that video 20 times and I still get some really cool stuff out of it every time. So to love God with all of our self, our whole being, our nephesh, It's about offering your entire physical being with all its capabilities and its limitations in an effort to love God and your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul puts it a little differently. In uh, Romans chapter 12, he writes, okay, I'm slow on the draw here. He writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. If you thought that coming to church and singing a few songs on a Sunday morning was worship, uh, that's a pretty narrow understanding here. It's offering our whole selves as living sacrifices. That is true spiritual worship. So that sounds great, but what does it look like? Well, not only are our bodies a good creation, a gift from God, when we look at the incarnation of Jesus, God becoming human just like us, that means uh, that it has something to say about our bodies, this in, the incarnation. And if we want to look to a picture of how it looks, all we got to do is look to Jesus. Jesus became a human being, and that means he had poopy diapers as a baby, he went through puberty, he had acne, he experienced social anxiety, he got hungry, he got frustrated, he got tired. And if we want to learn how to love God with all of our nephesh, the incarnation of Jesus should show us what it looks like. Let's consider the words from from the the letter to the Hebrews as translated by uh, Eugene Peterson. He calls this, in in Hebrews 4, he calls this uh, passage the high priest who cried out in pain. the, the, The writer is saying, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who's out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. 
we want to learn how to love God with our whole nefesh, the incarnation should show us what this looks like. So I want to do a little survey of what the Bible has to say about this. Um, But before we go into that survey, just a little caveat here. The physical realities that Jesus experienced as a first century Jewish carpenter is different from our physical realities in the 21st century. For example, the relationship between work and food was completely different. Up until about 100 years ago, most of us had physical labor jobs, and those jobs focused on producing or procuring enough food to stay alive. Ancient grains. Now, for us today, most of us, our labor is now fairly sedentary by comparison. And um, by the time we procure the food with the fruits of our labor, it's packaged and processed and hardly resembling the kind of food that our ancestors ate. And, um, and when it comes to physical activity, most of the time now our activities of, uh, of a physical nature are more associated with recreation than with our jobs or work. So when we look to Jesus to learn how to live at peace with these bodies of ours, we're going to have to dig a little deeper um, because there are no stories in the Gospels that deal directly with our modern concerns like diet, exercise, body image. But that doesn't mean that Jesus is out of touch with our reality. It just means that we have to work a little harder to see it. So let's dive in, and I'm going to go quick here, but there are going to be four things that I'm going to try and share with you Uh, from the Bible that impact our view of our bodies. So first off, our bodies are good and they're meant to be enjoyed. When you look at the life of Jesus, he modeled that he was capable of enjoying his physical life and the simple pleasures that come with it. Um, it, the, The writers make no secret of it that Jesus was a morning person. He was in the habit of getting up early and going outside to pray on a regular basis. So I suspect many mornings he enjoyed the warmth of the rising sun on his face. Simple pleasure, especially when you come out of a dark winter, eh? And uh, the Pharisees also noticed that Jesus was capable of enjoying life. Um, when they were badmouthing John the Baptist, they badmouthed him. They thought he was demon possessed because he was such an ascetic and kind of a wild living, uh, like a, like a, he deprived himself. But then they like when they would like badmouth Jesus, they accused him of being a drunk and a glutton. Um, he was known for enjoying the company of his friends around food and good good food and drink, and even his disciples. Uh, Uh, They followed in his footsteps. They didn't fast while they were with Jesus. Whereas John the Baptist's disciples, they were confused because John had them fasting all the time. And I think they were maybe kind of jealous of Jesus' disciples. But Jesus explained. He's like, fasting as a spiritual slash physical discipline, it, it has its place. But would you mourn with the bridegroom at his wedding reception? Jesus encouraged celebration and enjoyment at the appropriate times in life. And in fact, it was at a wedding party that he performed his first wedding when they ran out of wine. He performed his first wedding, performed his first miracle when they ran out of wine. I don't know if Jesus performed any weddings. Anyways, that's the first thing. Our bodies are good and they're meant to be enjoyed. Secondly, our bodies are not the foundation of our identity. In, in Jesus' most famous sermon, he directly says, life is more than the body. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or wear. Think of flowers. Uh, they don't worry about anything, and yet they're incredibly beautiful just by being what God created them to be. Our identity goes way deeper than our bodies. Because we were created in the image of the God of the universe. And this this principle makes me think of an Old Testament story that I I just kind of call the the tale of two kings. Uh, Back in 1 Samuel, we're talking about Samuel again. We were talking about him uh, when he was dedicated. But when he was grown up, 
in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, we are told that he was tasked with anointing Israel's first king. And uh, the Bible's pretty sparse on details, but we do know that Saul, uh, the one redeeming feature he had was that he was tall. All right, tall guy, must be a good king. Samuel anoints him, and that monarchy didn't go so well. Because seven chapters later, Samuel's out looking for another king to anoint. And that's when he runs into Jesse and his family of of strapping young men. And there too, Samuel almost gets caught up, and Jesse uh, is is caught up in it too. In fact, um, David, who became the next king, didn't even, he was the runt of the litter. In fact, his dad, Jesse, didn't even bother to like bring him out before Samuel to begin with because he was obviously not king material, not nearly tall enough, I guess. But this is what, this is what the Lord had to say to Samuel about uh, what kind of king he was looking for. He said, the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. Remember how it went last time you considered height? The Lord doesn't look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So our bodies, we can enjoy them. It's fun to dress up and enjoy life, but it's not what we do with our bodies or what our bodies, how they look, that define who we are. We are image bearers of the Creator, and God looks at the totality of us, even into our heart. Thirdly, Our bodies are the new temple of God. It's a little interesting piece of uh, Bible symmetry that I want you to notice. In the Old Testament, in in, in books like Exodus and Numbers, when they're talking about God's presence in the tabernacle, it it looked like a column of cloud or a uh, by day and a column of fire by night, just resting on the tabernacle. And that's, when people knew, that's how people knew that God's presence was with them. And if you fast forward to the book of Acts, Luke makes an interesting observation on that first Christian Pentecost. Um, at that moment, uh, the Holy Spirit came and breathed new life into God's people, and uh, fire came. The same, like, there, there's the connection there. And Only this time, it didn't come to rest on the temple in Jerusalem. It came into the upper room and and spread itself out over all of God's people and came to rest on people. God's new temple is us. Our bodies are a temple. And and Paul is a bit more explicit about this. And uh, it's it's when he's dealing with the Corinthian church that he, uh, he gets quite specific about it. In 1 Corinthians 6... He's teaching them and telling them about the importance of of sexual purity, actually. But he says some things that are really interesting regarding our bodies. In verse 13, uh, Paul is is kind of summarizing the mindset of of the Corinthian church. uh, And he's kind of quoting them as saying, um, Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will destroy them both. You see, they kind of had this idea that it was kind of a uh, our, our physical existence was kind of a consumable, something to be used up and tossed away, you know, like a, like a Kleenex or, or something like that. And Paul's like, no, no, uh, your bodies are much more than that. And, and, and that's why, <laughs> and that, that's why you should, should avoid sexual immorality because later on in that verse it says, um, the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. And then a little further on there on verse 19, he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So, so that's profound. That this is actually, our physical existence is connected to our our spiritual relationship to God. And that kind of leads into the fourth thing that I wanted to share with you. And that is, uh, our bodies can connect us to Christ in profound ways. Um, Paul, when you read through Paul, I, this is, I partly don't like Paul because of this, but he talks a lot about disciplining our bodies and being disciplined and all that stuff, and, and that, that's really hard to, <laughs> to live up to. Um, but in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 
He, he uses Olympic athletes as an example, and he, and he notes that, you know, athletes, they go into strict training so that they can win a gold medal that they'll wear around their neck, but that gold medal will, like, tarnish and fade eventually, or maybe it's stolen, uh, and, and he, he contrasts that with, like, if, if, a, if an elite athlete will do that to get a gold medal that is here today, gone tomorrow... How much more ought we to be motivated to discipline ourselves for a much more lasting reward, which is like our eternal life in God, uh, the abundant life? I think it's funny. We call them spiritual disciplines, but most of them involve our bodies. That should be a clue as to how integral our bodies are to our life in Christ. And, And one of my favorite passages... Uh, uh, in Philippians. It's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. It really explains the connection here between our bodies and our experience of all the good stuff that Jesus has for us. Uh, it's Paul talking to them and, and he's just, just passionately just sharing his heart and he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. There, there's something about experiencing suffering in a physical way that helps us identify with Jesus, the suffering servant. And, and in some mysterious way, when, when we experience that identification through suffering, we somehow are, it opens a portal to kind of break through and experience the resurrection power that God has for all of us. Um, one, one way that I can kind of encapsulate this experience is that every now and then I've gone on these crazy things called 444 workouts with, uh, with Jeremy Donnell and, and a few other people. It, this is a, a fourth musketeer workout ritual. On the fourth Friday of the month at 444 in the morning, we get up and we go and do a workout led by Jeremy, who is one of the buffest guys I know. And... Um, I always, like, just hate myself when the alarm goes off before 4.44, and I'm like, why am I doing this? And then by the time I drag my dead nefesh into the workout, I'm like, okay, this isn't so bad. And then usually by the end, I'm like, man, I'm glad I did this. And uh, every now and then, uh, some of the, one or two of the friends that that I've met through this this group of crazies, they'll say something really interesting to me. They'll say, at the end of the workout, they'll say, it was good to suffer with you this morning, brother. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. But like, that workout is a metaphor. And by pushing myself hard, pushing myself harder than maybe I think I could, I'm, I'm, I'm able to identify just a teensy bit with my Savior, and then by having the experience of, of going through the whole thing and realizing what, a, what an invigorating experience it was and that I was actually capable of doing more than I thought possible, I'm, I feel empowered afterwards. I can feel God's power in a, in a tangible way. It, that's, that's how powerful the metaphor is. And so our bodies, when we do stuff like that, can really connect us to experiencing God. So... I, more could be said. Uh, there's, I mean, we haven't even touched on sexuality. We haven't touched on, really talked a lot about what embodied worship looks like. I could preach more sermons about our physical lives, but I got to stop there. And I just want to close with a little bit of, uh, I don't know, free advice on ways to kind of help get a healthy body image. And it involves making some observations and asking ourselves some pointed questions. So, first thing is it's probably wise to limit or at least be highly skeptical of the visual media that we consume around us. I'm talking about media literacy. I got, I got news for you. The world tells lies. And most of the time, it's because they want your money. So when you consume media, it's not like you can like just avoid it. It's everywhere. But when you consume that media... It's important to ask yourself, who's profiting who, from this ideal body image that I'm being sold? Are they profiting at the expense of the body that God has given me? 
Second thing, our appearance is not our most important feature. Body image is not the source of our value as humans. It's God's image that gives us intrinsic value. So when you look at the mirror and you start to make value judgments about yourself, I'm not saying become slobs here because it doesn't matter, but when you're in the mirror and you make those value, you know, innocuous value judgments, it's important to just ask yourself, who's telling me who I am? Is it the culture around me or is it God? Number three, the closer, let's say you're into pursuing an ideal. The closer one gets to the ideal, the more entangling and unsatisfying it can get. And so as you work towards a fitness goal, it's really important to ask yourself, why am I pursuing this goal? Am I doing it to take care of God's temple, this creative gift that he's given me? Or is it to manipulate it in some way, other way, for some other ungodly purpose? Number four. Uh, we have an obligation to take care of ourselves. But at the same time, we should be flexible. Uh, not every piece of pizza is a life and death moral decision. So when you consider your own body, and when you're thinking about it even right now, ask yourself, is it time I make a change? And if your answer is yes, I would invite you to join me and our pastoral staff in something that uh, we, we, we've, been to, we've been taught it's called the health project um, we've, been, uh, we've been experimenting with this project since January and it's something that was developed by a friend of mine in Calgary who's, who's encouraged all the Alliance pastors in Alberta to try and I won't say much about it now but I just want to invite you in and, and, and offer the chance to get more information about this it's, it's not a diet program or a, or a workout regime. It's just a simple step-by-step -step pathway for becoming more intentional about being in sync with God's design for our bodies. So if you want more information about that, like if when I said, is it time for a change, and your heart said yes, uh, I would encourage you to take out your phone right now and uh, email me the simple words health project to mike at cochranalliance.com and, uh, and I, I, can, I, can, I can give you that information and get you started on that. Um, if you're not the emailing type, uh, you, can, you can give me uh, contact information at the reception desk, and uh, I'll be happy to get back to you. Um, it's, it's important that you don't hesitate to inform yourself and take just little baby steps towards being more in sync with God's design for our bodies. So like I said, there's more that could be said about this, but time's limited here. This isn't the only form where we can like spur each other on. So if, if you're interested in, in, in talking about this topic more, I'd invite you to check out our Facebook discussion group, share your stories, ask your questions, uh, give your insights, and um, it's a great place for us to kind of go deeper in other directions than what we can in a short time here. So to wrap up, I want us to go back to where we began there with what Paul said about worship. Um, you know, he said to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. I, I want to I reiterate that and reread re that to you, only I'm going to do it from uh, the message because it really teases out, I think, and speaks into our culture uh, in terms of our relationship with our bodies today. And he places it under the head heading of place your life before God. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life you're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit right in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, and he develops well-formed maturity in you. And so I just, we're going to close today just giving you an opportunity to do that, just to embrace what God does for you and, and, uh, and place your life, your body, your nefesh, 
before God as an offering. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come up here now, and we're just going to respond in a time of worship. And you've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again, is that God gave us a body for a reason, and it can help us connect to God. And so worship God today with your, your hands. Worship him with your eyes and your voice and your ears and, and your knees and your legs if you have to. But use your body to just scri- ascribe to God the worth that, that, that he has. And, um, um, and, and you'll be amazed at how just using your body it pr- opens a channel for us to experience God's presence in, in a new way. So I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer, and then Kevin, you're going to lead us. Jesus, I, I want to thank you again for our bodies, and I just ask you that as we, as we consider our everyday mumbo-jumbo mundane life, I, I pray that you would open our eyes to the possibilities of how we can offer all that stuff to you as our act of worship, as our living sacrifice to you. And so as we, uh, as we just come to you now one more time in response, I pray that you would meet us in a special way. Amen.